Welcome to the uh, afternoon session. So uh, I'm Kalle Sergesson from Ethicode, and I work as a director of Ethicode Root Operations. So I have about 70 people under me in three locations. I've been at Ethicode for about four and a half years, and I was in the game industry before uh, moving to Helsinki and moving to Ethicode. I used to be like this charming, fun guy and loved my life and lived in Germany, which, yeah, let's not talk about Germany. Um, I studied in Kleania, moved to Finland, and I did some bookkeeping during my youth, like nine years of such uh, family companies and things like that. So, kind of busy youth. And today I'm here to talk about um, Ethicode Sauna. Because I was asked to keep a workshop, and I was like, well, everybody loved my puppet video about ethical sauna and asked me more information. So let's go to microservices through ethical sauna. So uh, ethical is uh, consultation, optimization, automation, consulting house since multitude of years ago, and now. We've been doing DevOps since 2007, and we have over 80 DevOps projects per year. And we've been doing root platform things since 2014, and we have over 130 DevOps consultants. The company itself is about 250 people, and we have a sauna. Well, I'm not talking about sauna. I'm not going to talk about our. Uh, infrastructure around sauna. So we got the sauna, we did some manual testing that what is a good heat for going to sauna as fins. And then we realized that, well, we could actually automate this and make it so that it informs us when to go to sauna and we could ask when the sauna is ready and all kinds of other stuff. So it all started in one evening uh, when we got a sensor, which we installed the sauna and it sends data through Raspberry Pi to an API, which types it to MongoDB. MongoDB because uh, the developers were thinking that it's very easy to use, and they didn't know that we are going to that's on analytics, like we did uh, last time we developed this. And then we made this HTML and JS website, and load balancing in front of it. And that was the basic we started here. And then we got greedy, and it became a microservice architecture where we have an estimator which calculates when the sauna is ready, and you can, whenever you want, ask in Slack, is the sauna ready? When is it ready? Can I go to sauna? What's happening? And it answers you, so it's normal chatbot. Then we created this sauna polar, so that's a script that goes and creates the API and Slack database and polls that, hey, sauna is now ready. And then there is first product feature which recognizes uh, when someone went to sauna. At first we were like, this is a stupid feature, but it's the most welcome feature because everybody in ten knows that there's people in the sauna and they want to be social. <laughs> that was very weird from Finnish, but hey, that happened. Um, in the picture, I'm missing uh, our newest feature, which is analytics. So we are creating analytics on how often the sauna is used, what's the usage percent. So it's about 30% in the whole year, sauna is on. And from that, it's about 30% that it's being used, according to our statistics. And that created another API here. And it started to create this microservice architecture. So we had trouble deploying, like where do we test, how do we know that all of these components work together. So I added a basic CI pipeline, which I'm going to show, and go through a zero downtime deployment and rollback features. And basically this is all what Root offers you easily. So we have a version control system connected to CI CD, which does testing, static analysis, and deployment. So very basic CI CD, but with uh, fun stuff. And I did promise that uh, we would go through what this looks like in enterprise scheme. And well, this is all fun and good, and this is what we are doing at 
home, and this is what works here. How does it uh, scale and enterprise level? As you can see, it's always a bit of a mess to go to enterprise. So I start, uh, drew some example of what it kind of looks like. End user being here, business user here, and I was here. All of the old stuff I drew here. So this is all the um, so-called legacy systems. So ESPs and so on. So if you don't know microservices, there are simple services that do one thing. And I tried to draw this here. So same thing as in our sauna, we have different things doing different, uh, very simple things, and we always make them into their own services. That way we can easily update them and keep them up to date. So in here, I'm trying to uh, create that uh, uh, understanding of what it looks like in corporate setting and why you need the CI CD pipeline. So if we would want to change our analytics notification, which is over here, and we need data from, uh, let's say, authentication services. Where would that data come from? Where would it travel through? Well, uh, our main point would be the message room over here, which we are sending all the data from other services. Or we could directly send it to the data lake, which would be stupid, because then we would have the direct integration. And how do we test all of this? Well, you don't unless you're doing CI, CD, like, this is now four services. Uh, let's say this is an email, this is a uh, Slack notification, this is a Teams notification, and this is authentication. You didn't even get the web page up yet. And that's the current day microservices. You could all also name these notifications, and then you would break this every time um, Slack API changes. Slack API thankfully doesn't change, but the idea is behind there. So the idea of this session is to show how to do this with this. So same principles, same things, but they were also here. Hopefully uh, that process through. If you have any questions, I can always go into, but yeah. Um, and then it's about memory. So I don't like talking too much. So I just before broke our website. So this is the temperature in sauna at the moment. And this is the basic statistics. And this is the analytic statistics. So it's a bit heavy, but it calculates the maximum temperatures, uh, the longest continuous time was 13 hours. Uh, favorite Friday, uh, non Friday has been Thursday, um, Tuesday, sorry, and uh, total sauna has been used 155 times and so on. So, this is its own component, and uh, this is its own component. And we're trying to do all of that in our version control through a controversial topic. Uh, so multi-repo versus monorepo. And uh, monorepo is very good and great at Google, but most of the tools don't support that so well on Dockerized Word. And multi-repo support is supported a lot better in stuff like Jenkins. So we have different build uh, pipelines for these repositories. So we have the estimator, Twitter, bot, and so on. And today we are touching this uh, sauna rasp, which is our main repository for the web page because it all started from the Raspberry Pi. <coughs> um, in here we have defined the build file, so get this file. This defines our build structure. So we have the steps that are being done. This is pretty badly written, but it works, so nobody has touched it. But the idea being that those could be made into generalized repos in future and have been in all of our customers. And then we have our get Docker files specified, so very simple Docker file. And then we have defined how to deploy it by Docker Compose. So in here, I have actually defined all of it, just so it can be deployed. All of it can be deployed easily from one place. 
So a developer can run this and they have the whole environment up and running. So basically what we're going to be doing is we have a load balancer, we have a MongoDB, our data disk and Soundbot. So this is the polling system and the Raspberry Pi that is the web page. And today the idea is to update that. So for doing the deployments on test and production, we have defined this amazing script called deploy as head, which is the only thing that it does actually is to be defined as either production or non-production. Um, all of this goes through the CI pipeline. So once again, multitude of pipelines for multitude of services. And in here we have the sound web page, which has branches. So we had this Ihanuga Paiva, which is our FedEx day, where we defined the uh, way of building and added the statistics uh, analysis uh, web page thing, and that was merged. And then we have our pipe, uh, build pipeline. So we're doing um, checkout, preparation for the build, Building and testing, so uh, our build script actually runs the tests also, so we don't have uh, acceptance tests here. Uh, I have been informed that we should write some robot framework tests, but we haven't needed them really. We add them, log in to Artifactory and deploy to Artifactory and then deploy to uh, our DevOps, uh, in this case to production, but it could be staging, development, whatever, based on your branch. Uh, we manage our secrets through uh, uh, a folder, so we have credentials in Jenkins level, where we have defined our uh, sauna credentials that we need to deploy. So we only need one thing, and that's the runs key. And after that, basically, uh, this one gets run, the whole pipeline, we'll show it in a bit. And we do a zero downtime update in uh, the sauna raspberry over here, which is attached to all of the services like this. We have the load balancer, Sun Raspberry, and MongoDB. Uh, this is not, uh, we don't have a direct integration between these requirements, but there is a requirement there that we have doc uh, sadly not documented in our Docker Compose. And we can also get the pipeline scripts from here automatically from Rancher. Um, we are using all guards uh, answer in this case because uh, we are well. This is two years old, two year old project, and we have not deployed it anywhere in two years. It works. So uh, idea being uh, that I want to now update this white web page to black back because it used to be black. And how do we do it? Well. Pretty simply, we you can see it here already, but I just basically go change our CSS like every other web page to black, and then we see the whole pipeline running in uh, actual production. And here, if we had a uh, bit uh, smart commits in use, I would add the git uh, URL commit. And, or so we hear our ticket and it would automatically go there. So I can show you how those work in a bit. Oh, I don't actually have time for that, but hopefully. Uh, so in the uh, changed or back to back. And now this gets pushed. And basically, if we had dependencies that we had defined in our sound raspberry. It would also pull, according to our Docker Compose, all those uh, other files, because we are doing the building, and test those in the pipeline. So we are deploying uh, on-demand wave uh, or agent now in nowadays. And that agent gets uh, deployed on uh, from scratch, and then it tests all of, the, all of this. So it gets this there is that Docker, so it's a Dockerized agent that doesn't exist until we need it. So we have a cluster behind it where we can tell it, hey, get us an agent, and it gives us an agent. So uh, 
we don't need any resources that we don't want to pay for. Then it does some uh, preparations that I need for our agent, and it does kit pull for all the components that we need, and building and testing. And it uh, logins and pushes statements to our artifactor and deploys. So it tells here that it, hey, please deploy and tests that it deploys. And then we do a zero downtime update. And that's very simply uh, how microservices and DevOps work in Sauna IoT. Questions so far? Too simple? Yeah? Uh, what do you use as load balancer uh, in the swarm? Um, so we have uh, HA proxy as a load balancer in this setup, and we could also use uh, Nginx, for example as well balancer uh, for software reasons. And we've also let uh, most of the architecture manage itself. So if we would have this in AVS, it would manage uh, use the AVS and well, this web page can be run as server as code. Yeah. Well, let's say you have a second summer. Could you just deploy the same system yeah. somewhere else? Yeah. And redirect using like like multi tenancy in the way. Yeah. For that setup. Yeah. So we have all of the configuration. Uh, basically, we actually ran this on two systems at the same time, because we actually deployed this to effisauna.com at the beginning, and that was not Effigold owned domain, and uh, it was actually one of our employees, and we decided that hey, we want uh, actually want to support this on. Uh, internal use, so we have like easy way of deploying, managing, and it's not stuck to anybody's uh, credit card, like it was. And we did a migration, so we had the <coughs> new system and old system running at the same time, and the data was being sent to both. So we would just tell the Raspberry Pi that, hey, please send data, and it would have the two systems at the same time updating. Um, basically, uh, with the Raspberry Pi, uh, the biggest different uh, hearts it would be if we would use direct IPs, so we have to use uh, DNSs and HTTPS, because otherwise we can't control where we deploy this system, and then we are screwed. Like uh, When you define something that's static and all that can change, then you're stuck to that. So, for example, IPs are not something that you can change from one data center, uh, one provider to another easily. So, you after want to have DNS, which you can change around everywhere. So, everything with DNS always in IoT. Thank you for great questions. Yeah. So, question. Uh, have you considered friendliness as well, or is there anything that you prefer? Uh, so it could be any definition of. Can you repeat the questions because? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So I was just asking if, if there's any reason to like use Docker Compose instead of Kubernetes, for example. Yeah. So uh, the reason it's uh, I was asked uh, if it's uh, if it should be why is it not Kubernetes instead of Docker Compose? So. The reason why it's Docker Compose is that the last commit is two years ago for the original Docker Compose file, and nobody has gone and changed it to Kubernetes yet. So uh, two years ago, uh, Docker was kind of new thing, and nobody was really touching it. Uh, like it was starting to go around, and thing one we we were seeing more and more usage, but. Uh, Kubernetes was uh, something that required you admins, people to deploy. It was not easy for anybody to develop against it. Uh, then about a year ago, Kubernetes started to get very popular. Like it, it uh, grew up. Every one thing was Kubernetes. Everybody had managed Kubernetes service. And then if we had written this one year ago, it would have been Kubernetes. And now Kubernetes is already so big that even Docker has informed that, yeah, we are not competing with Kubernetes. Uh, here's a Docker Compose files that run in Kubernetes. Yeah, so uh, everything could be Kubernetes and should be Kubernetes to current day. Uh, this is just an example of that you have to have everything in version control and how, what it looks like. 
So uh, I guess we should go back and redo our own architecture of SAL. And then, if nothing else from the demo, then I have some slides of ethical root to explain why, how, uh, how we provide this as a service and why we provide it as a service for our customers. So. Uh, our customers are used to writing those pipelines, writing those systems, uh, doing all of this, like, uh, that's easy. But managing all of the tools like uh, Bitbucket, Yankee, our Confluence, Jenkins, um, they will, developers rarely have time to update this or upkeep this. Uh, security becomes an issue, uh, tools keep uh, changing, and then you just tune it uh, according to whatever is needed based on whenever you have time. And then nothing actually gets developed in the tool system. You just try to keep up while your pipelines move forward. Um, so Ethical decided that, hey, let's take all of this and offer it as a package for companies and let the developers focus on writing those pipelines and going forward with those pipelines. And for that, we got nice customers like OP, DNA, and then we did some math. So I had some time with our consultants and I had some time with our uh, sales. So average consultant costs about 110 euros per hour in Finland at the moment uh, on DevOps. Uh, in development teams, they usually have to tune develop DevOps environments, of course. But uh, usually you don't buy a DevOps consultant to do tuning of environments. You purchase them to do transformation, helping the team to get moving, and then kicking him, kick him out when the DevOps is moving. Well, you can't really kick him out if he does your DevOps tools also. And we don't really like that this is 1,800 per month just for upkeeping tools. Well, the research says that of the 80% that were working on DevOps transformations, 50% of their time went to tools instead of the transformation. So instead of the, even the 10%, it was something like 9,000 in every code's DevOps consulting. Um, that's kind of a down number, and we don't even know how many, uh, what it is in actual production scale. And you can also think, in, think it in internal way. Like if you have a DevOps person who is supposed to do the DevOps transformation, he's not supposed to be upkeeping tools. He's supposed to help the company to go DevOps. And it's kind of expensive if he keeps upkeeping the tools instead of working the DevOps transformation, especially if you uh, pay top money for that person to upkeep them. Yeah, there's a white paper coming out from this. Yeah, and um, that's it from me. Any more questions? Challenges for my math? <laughs> so that's one consultant. So if you have 10 teams, you have 10 consultants, and then you have 10 times that. <laughs> yeah. Or if you have center of excellence DevOps, which is usually 20 to 40 people easily. Um, so you got time goes in there. Yeah. yeah. This is what many companies are fighting actually. Like they try to go to DevOps and then they hire someone and then that person becomes the DevOps tools person instead of the DevOps consultant, uh, like transformation consultant. I'm gonna talk tomorrow how to how what this looks like and how it's so solved. So I have a business workshop tomorrow about this. Please do challenge. This is intended to like this is what the data sold and I'm very really glad to discuss about the data. Where is the white panel coming out Um hopefully in February. Christmas is around the corner, so that's gonna show down a bit. But we have text ready and it's 
just about rewriting a lot of things that I wrote. I'm not very good at writing. So if you have read my thesis, it's full of mistakes and spelling and errors and illogical things. So yeah, we need to do some more um, code writing on my paper. If you'd like to know about root, uh, who to ask? Um, we have our ethical root uh, booth upstairs, and then we have uh, Nico over there, and Yuka, and the JP, and me, of course. And uh, you can ask any one of us, or you can go to ethical root booth and get yourself some swag, I think. Yeah, Nico is saying that we have nice stickers that I, that I haven't even gotten. You should visit the board. <laughs> <laughs> And if you want a hat, please do come by the Atrocyan uh, booth. We have hats. Okay, what if you want to see the architecture at closer depth? Um, architecture can be found on either, uh, again, on the ethical root part uh, booth, I guess. Yeah or, yeah, yeah, or you can get it from the Atrocyan booth, or you can call us and we will easily uh, gladly come and discuss about this. We also have it. Uh, public repo? Um, no, it's not. Um, it is not public at the moment, uh, the source code how we deploy it, because it's, uh, how, how would I say, it's a lot of ANSI push scripts that have been evolving over the years, and they are, they are pretty good nowadays, but when we started they were not something that could be open sourced. And at the moment they are not something we want to open source because there is no documentation for it. So as long as we don't have any documentation for our scripts, uh, it would not benefit anybody. It just it's just a bunch of ANSI books that you can get from ANSI book Galaxy anyway. Because the documentation is on the same level that hey, you should have IP somewhere. Yeah, but where do you want us to put the IP? Well, you should know where you put the IP in this library. And uh, that's usually the open source state, but we don't want to deploy something like that as ethical. Like uh, we have Open Framework plugin and InfoxDB plugin, which are very uh, very liked plugins in the Engines community. And both of them have very good documentation, and we are trying to push this to the same level before deploying anything to open source. <coughs> Yeah. We have kind of ready-made tool set for this uh, yeah. ethical room. So is it, pro is it possible like to deviate or yes. some other tools? Like if you are not like with the Atlassian flag, which <coughs> are with Atlassian at the point, but maybe there are some other things that people want to get into. So um, the question was if the, you can deviate from this. So the idea is that, uh, hey, let's move from, uh, can you deviate from this stack? So, Yes, you can deviate from this stack quite a lot. Uh, there are certain things that we don't recommend on deviating. Uh, for example, uh, continuous integration, yes, there is a lot of other tools, and yes, we know of them. Yes, Chrome is amazing, Circus AI is amazing, if you just do Docker. But most companies don't do just Docker, there is other tools. Um, other things like monitoring, you don't need to give it to us, we are just offering it as part because we want to be able to help our customers that in any level 